great to be with you again this morning. We're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. And uh, before we begin, I want to again encourage you to attend the Tabor Lecture Series, not this Friday, but next Friday, April 1st and 2nd. Uh, Dr. Chad Van Dixhorn is arguably the foremost world scholar on the Westminster Assembly uh, from a Bible-believing perspective and uh, considered a, a good public speaker as well. Um, it's going to be a mix of church history, theology, and practical application as well. So I encourage you all to come and um, bring others with you. Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 6. This is the word of our Lord. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtain a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was a righteous. He was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he be, being dead still speaks by faith faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him for before he was taken he had this testimony that he pleased God but without faith it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him is the word of our Lord. Let us pray together. Father, we pray that you open our eyes to see wonderful things concerning you from this this portion of your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you haven't noticed, the last two years have created uh, uh, so much change, so much uncertainty, so much uh, disruption. Uh, even before we began here, you guys were talking about how you have to make appointments still to do things because of all the COVID issues. And one, one of the things that this disruption of the usual has caused us to do is to reconsider what success is. Perhaps not deliberately, but we have changed our goals as a society and as, as a, uh, uh, even in the church. Not getting sick became the main goal of some people. Staying alive became the main thing that people wanted to do. More than staying alive was not dying. There's a difference between staying alive and not dying. People are just more concerned about not dying than actually living in the, for the last couple of years. For some, just to survive the, epidem the, ep the pandemic was over, uh, till the pandemic was over, was just the meaning of life. That's all they wanted to do. Now, I wanted to, to harness this time of reevaluation that you're going, we have been going through for the last couple of years to encourage all of us to rethink how we define success. What is, it, what is a successful believer in Jesus Christ? The last time I spoke uh, here in chapel, we enlisted the Beatles to teach us. And the, the, the Beatles taught us that all we need is love. Uh, foundational to our definition of success is being loved by God and loving him back. Today I wanted to enlist another uh, boy band from the 60s to help us. Uh, have you ever heard of the Monkees? Yes. There was even a, a, a TV series uh, of the Monkees. And the Monkees will help us understand that, uh, that each one of us must say, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. And that's really at the core of the definition of success, remembering I am a believer. To be successful, truly and really successful, we have to believe that what, we have to believe what we believe. Does it make sense to you? We have to believe what we believe. Sometimes we have our statements of faith, we have the things we say that we believe, but then life hits and that belief doesn't come out in what we do. So in order to be successful, we must believe in what we believe. Believe Success is believing. Uh, 
success in, in, in overall is pleasing God, and you can't please God apart from believing God. God simply will not take pleasure in us or in our accomplishments apart from faith, no matter how great those accomplishments are. Accomplishments are. You can see that in verse 6, where the Holy Spirit says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. As a matter of fact, the book of Proverbs says it, that even the plowing of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. The, the, the daily good things of life are an abomination to the Lord when they're not done in faith. Without faith, there is no success. That's the point of verse 6. And a faith that is acceptable to God believes at least two things. It believes that God exists and it believes that God rewards his people. All of faith can be summarized, can fit under these two categories. God exists and he rewards his people. Everything else, all the other I believes, all the creeds can fit under these two statements. God exists and he rewards those who seek him. So the first component of a successful faith is believing that God exists. And just to state the very obvious, uh, at church I often tell people that my kids um, endearingly or sometimes not so endearingly call me Captain Obvious because I have this necessity to state the obvious. And you'd be surprised as a pastor how often the obvious is not as obvious as it should be to people. But just to state the very obvious, do believing that, that God exists means that one must believe in the objective reality of God. Not that God exists within you, but that God exists apart from you. The objective reality of God. That means believes that believing that God really exists. In the context of Hebrews, a belief that God is, as it says here in verse 6, means that one must believe that the sovereign, miracle-working God of the Old Testament, the God of the Bible, exists. The, verse 6 is not given to us in a vacuum is in the context of Hebrews. And in the author of Hebrews believed that that God that's in the Old Testament, that sovereign God, that miracle-working God, that creating God, is the God that is. He's not arguing for some other God, but to the God about the God of the Bible. So to, to believe that God is, is to believe that the God of the Bible is, exists objectively. That in reality, we have that God. And that's exactly what the saints in Hebrews 11 believed, whose faith we're supposed to emulate. They believed that God was all-powerful, all-present, and all-knowing, and that He was holy, just, good, gracious, merciful, and wise. They believed all that, all that about God because they believed what their history, their prophets, their scripture, and their experience taught them. So they didn't believe in a God that you could conceive. They didn't believe in the AA God. No, a God that you can make after your own self, but they believed in the God of the Bible. So when the author of Hebrews says in verse 6 that we have to believe that God is, it's not any God. It's the God that is revealed to us in the Scriptures. And they believe that this magnificent God really existed. It is the same faith in the same God that we have. They are the pattern of our faith. We believe in the great God of the Scriptures. We believe in the God who is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in His being and wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. And belief in this amazing God leads to the second half of verse 6. We, have, we must believe that God is and that he is, he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Our brothers and sisters of Hebrews chapter 11 certainly believed that God would reward them, though often it was difficult to see how. Some were called to trust in God's ultimate blessing and equity, that is justice, with suffering even unto death. Look at verse 35 of chapter 11. Women receive their dead, raised of to life again that's that's easy those are the ones that had a harder uh, easier time humanly speaking to see god as a rewarder but look at the second half others were tortured 
not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And these also believed that God was the rewarder of those who diligently sought, sought him. Others were called upon to believe that God rewards by turning away, turning their back on the riches of the world. In verse 27, speaking of Moses, it says, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He turned his back on the riches, Moses did, believing that God is the reward of those who diligently seek, seek him. Whether these great people of faith were called to focus their belief on God's rewards in history or in eternity, they all believed that God was actively working in them and through them and for them. They actively believed that God was the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And in that, and because of that, they were successful because they were believers. They believed that God would reward them even though they could not always see or understand. Without this faith, it is impossible to please God. Without this faith, life cannot be called a success, no matter what others may call it. So the, the most successful worldly person, if they're not, if they don't have this faith, this trust that's described here, in God's scheme, he's a failure. She's a failure. And even the most humble person in the church of Jesus Christ is a great success because he or she possesses this kind of faith. So true success is measured by believing what we believe. We, we can list the things we believe, but often we live, we, we live in practice other things. We don't live those things that we say that we believe in practice. We fight to the death those, uh, those who deny the fundamental elements of our faith, our creed. Now we will argue till we die for the truths of the Westminster Standards, and we should, but when it comes to facing everyday issues, loving our wife, being patient with our kids, uh, loving the brethren, we can end up acting contrary to what we believe. Uh, what we often need is really a rebirth of faith, a re-strengthening of our faith, a new believing in what we already believe. Not a new faith, but a recommitment to the faith we already have, to the truth that the God of the Scriptures exists. In, in, in addition to the massive truth about God known to the Old Testament saints, saints, we, through the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, can understand even more. So remember that all these saints that are listed in Hebrews 11 only had the Old Testament. We have the fullness of the revelation of God. And the God of the New Testament is not greater than the God of the Old Testament because He's the same God. But the New Testament revelation of God is greater. As the Apostle John so beautifully says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. And that word declare there means to explain, to exegete. Jesus exegetes God to us. A benefit that the saints of Hebrews 11 never had. We can understand the full revelation of God. Ultimately, we know that God exists because of Jesus Christ as He reveals Himself to us as the Creator sustainer and goal of creation. Paul in Colossians 1 verse 16 says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. So we must believe what we believe concerning Christ as the creator. Christ created the invisible world, thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. And Christ created the visible world. Christ created the stars of heaven. Christ created the colors of the spectrum, which for us in this room is red, blue, yellow, and green, because we're men. I think those are the only colors we recognize. God created the worms that come up during the rainy storm. And Christ created all these things. And Christ did that all ex nihilo out of nothing. 
It's not like he pulled a rabbit out of a hat. There was no hat to pull a rabbit out of. He created it out of nothing. That is the God that we must believe that he is, that he exists. We must believe what we believe concerning Christ as the sustainer. Again, in Colossians 1 verse 17, Paul says, He is before all things, and in him all things consist. Christ is responsible for sustaining the existence of every created thing. Now, the tense that Paul uses here in Colossians 1 emphasizes that Christ continues presently to hold all things together. Apart from Christ's continuous action, the whole universe would disintegrate. We tend to rely too much on natural law and I mean physical laws and we try to explain everything in terms of gravity and and uh, the three uh, laws of, uh, of Newton or the laws of therm thermodynamics that describe how the universe generally works. But those laws are just manifestation of Christ by the word of his power, as Hebrews 1, 3 says, keeping everything together. It's interesting that, and he does all that just by the word of, of his power. Every electron, every neutron, every nuclear force is working because God, Christ currently is making it work by the word of his power, the same word that we faithfully proclaim every Lord's Day at our churches. Christ is the ultimate unifying force that physicists are searching for. That's the thing, that's a great search that physicists are, go through, it's looking for the force that's keeping everything together. And I don't mean that in a Star Wars sort of force way. But what, how can I explain that the universe has not lost, that run out of energy? Because if it's been around for billions of years, there's just not enough energy in the universe for, to, if, to justify its existence. So what keeps things together? And they're always looking for it. Nuclear weaker forces, nuclear stronger forces, string theory. The Bible has told us it's Christ. That's what keeps the universe together. That's what keeps the universe from this integrating and this is what we believe but do we really believe it and do we really believe that is this word of Christ that we proclaim every Sunday and that's the word of Christ that works in the hearts of people and bring people who are dead in their sins back to life that that brings vast valleys of dry bones to life to follow the Lord Jesus Christ if we do then we have a Christology that will see us through the most difficult of times and will give birth to even greater faith. So do you believe that he is? That is, do you believe that he is all of this? John in 1 John makes clear that you either have the whole Christ, the God-man, or you have no Christ at all. Do you believe all that he is? We must believe that we must believe what we believe concerning Christ as the goal of all things. Uh, the, the majestic truths of his creating and sustaining power demand this conclusion. Again, Colossians 1 16 says, All things are created for him. All creation is moving toward its goal, and its goal is Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says in Titus chapter 2 that our blessed hope, the things that motivate us to keep on going, is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our resurrection. Everything began with him, he is the creator of all things, and will end with him. Everything in creation, everything in history, and every spiritual reality is moving towards Christ and for Christ. And we might believe that that is the God who is. We must believe what we believe concerning Christ as our loving head. Again, Colossians 1, 18 through 20 says, He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Because Christ is the beginning of all things and the end of all things, He is to be preeminent. He is to be first in all of life. He is our head. And our head has reconciled us to His Father through His own blood, 
shed on the cross. The creator, sustainer, and goal of all things love us. And the cross is the measure of that love. Christ is the lover of our souls, and that is the God who is. Do you believe that this God is? Not some other God out here, out there. We believe that. Now, do we believe that we believe that? Do we act out? Do we live that way? Is Christ really the head of everything that we do? Is Christ the head of our local churches? Are we trying to do everything in our local churches according to what Christ commands us to do? Or are we are here to entertain men? Who is the head? Christ? Or the people that you want to attract to your church? What you believe about Christ is everything. That's it. What you believe about Christ is everything. If you believe that Christ is the creator of everything, every cosmic speck across, across trillions of light years of space, the creator of the textures and shapes and colors that, that dazzle our eyes, if you believe that he is the sustainer of all creation, the force presently holding the atoms of your body, sitting on that chair, and this whole universe together, and that without him all would dissolve. If you believe that he is the goal of everything, that all creation is moving toward him. If you further believe that this God is the lover of your soul, then you believe in the God that is. In Hebrews eleven six, you believe that the God of the scriptures exists. And as believers, we do believe this. Anything less than that is sub-Christian. So do you truly believe in what you believe? If, you're, if your belief is deepening, though you have been a believer for years, it will change your life even right now. Because this belief assures you that your life is in the hand of a sovereign God and not... A twig tossed about by every tide of the ocean because you believe that you are the object of an infinite love which desires the best for you because you with you with such a God as this you have no option but to believe that he is the rewarder of those who seek him Christ blesses his people in, the, in this life and the life to come. He rewards his people. In, in, in Matthew 25, we have those great words, Well done, good and faithful servant, pronounced to his people. In Matthew 25, we have the even greater words, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And you know what the greatest reward he gives to us? Himself. himself. Remember what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3? He counts everything lost, that was lost. The good things he accomplished, the bad things he has done, he counts all that as manure, as dung that he might pursue the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that he might, that he might attain even the resurrection that he might even partake in the sufferings of Jesus Christ and Christ gives that to his people so uh, based on these things that I've presented to you the, today ask yourself the following three questions am I believing that God can take care of me am I believing that he loves me Am I believing that he rewards, that is, he's active on behalf of those who seek him? Am I believing that God is active on my behalf? And we think of rewards as just good as we define good. In Hebrews 2, there's this intriguing passage where it says, the author says, that Christ, the Son, prayed that the Father would deliver him from dying, from death. And then he says, and the father did. And he said, wait a minute. That doesn't seem to be right because I read in the Gospels that Jesus died, that he prayed at Gethsemane, and yet said, whatever your will is, and next, the next morning was the crucifixion, and he died. The point is that God rewarded Jesus 
freed him from death through death in bringing him to life. So God rewards according to what he calls good. And we can take that to the bank. Christ, the creator, the sustainer, the goal and lover of our soul. That's the God we believe. So do you believe in what you believe? If so, you are very successful people. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for...